There was a story that made its way into the news some years back about a Boston orthopedic surgeon who was suspended from his practice by the state medical board. Now what happened was that this surgeon was in the middle of a spinal fusion procedure. And as this procedure was going on, it went on longer than he thought it was going to go on. And during the whole course of the procedure, he kept asking different co-workers that he was working with, did the checks arrive yet? Did we get the checks yet? Finally, one, another surgeon who wasn't trained in the particular medicine, the particular practice that this surgeon was doing, namely spinal fusion surgery, the surgeon comes and drops off this other surgeon's check. When he gets the check, he tells his co-workers and employees, hey, I just got to step out, I'll be back shortly. He asks this other surgeon to stand in this place and bear in mind this other surgeon was not equipped to do the surgery that this other man was performing. So he goes and he leaves and the guy who's being operated on is on the table. True story, it happened in it happened 2002, I believe. This guy is on the table with an open incision on his back. He's under anesthesia and the doctor who's performing spinal fusion surgery goes and where does he go? He goes to the bank to make a deposit. Said he was going to be not too long. He ends up being a half an hour. He comes back and you can understand why the people that he worked with were pretty upset with the decision that he made. And they brought it up and he got um, relieved of his practice because the state medical board understood and thought that back surgery was more important than a bank deposit. And he saw that he was derelict in his responsibilities. Now I don't think people in this room would necessarily do something like that. But I don't presume that everybody in this room is free from the temptation that money presents and free from all the stresses that money provide. I don't think that everybody in this room is free from the Hebrews 13.5 exhortation, keep yourselves free from the love of money. And the strange thing that can happen in our lives is that money could be used in such a way to so jade our vision, to so dis distort our vision, that all of a sudden we have misplaced priorities. And we could think, it means more to me right now to get to the bank, to make a bank deposit, because I don't want to pay any you know, fees if the bank has to cover anything, if I get some you know, bank service charges for bouncing a check. I think it's more important to get there than it is to tend to a human life that's on an operating table. And again, I don't think that you would necessarily be prone to that kind of mistake, that kind of sin. But I don't think the warning of pulling up the weeds that grow in our spiritual lives in this world that can be called the deceitfulness of riches that pose themselves as raiment more beautiful than that of Solomon's and these weeds of money desires grow in our lives and all of a sudden if you're not pulling them up regularly all of a sudden it could obscure your view of God and the view that God, the, the, your view of who, what God's called you to do it could be a very serious thing in the surgeon's case he was suspended for leaving the OR, and when he stood before the medical board, he told them that he regretted what he did and that, quote, he exercised horrible judgment. Now, you might hear that and think, well, yeah, how did he not know that before? How did he not know when he was leaving to make a bank deposit that somebody wasn't going to call him out, call him on the carpet for that? Well, exercising remarkably horrible judgment sometimes can look obvious, and sometimes it doesn't look so obvious. Let me illustrate to you what I mean. When I was first saved, I started reading, obviously, the scriptures, but I had some other books come into my possession shortly after knowing Christ, and I enjoyed reading them, one of which was John Piper's Don't Waste Your Life. And I remember being on the express bus traveling to and from Manhattan I was, as I was going to Pace, and I had an internship in the city, and I remember reading through Don't Waste Your Life. Well, in the third chapter, there's a subheading that reads like this, quote, An American Tragedy, How Not to Finish Your Life. Now that grabs your attention. You read that and you say, wait, an American tragedy, how not to finish your life. That, that grabs your attention. So I start reading it. And as I begin reading it, John Piper tells a story that he had read in a 1998 edition of Reader's Digest. In this story, it spoke about a couple who, quote, took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. He thought it was a joke. 
He thought it was a spoof on the American dream, but it wasn't. If you read in the book, he's like, that was the dream. And then he goes on and he says this, Tragically, this was the dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life, and let the last great work of your life before you give an account to your Creator be this, playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them before Christ at the day of judgment, the great day of judgment. Look, Lord, see my shells? That is a tragedy. See, so sometimes remarkably horrible judgment can look obvious, and sometimes it could be well packaged in the presentation of the American dream. And what Jesus is warning his disciples against, and what he's warning us against today in this text, is against that kind of horrible judgment. And he does so through a remarkable series of contrasts. Now, before we consider the declarations that Jesus made, in the text before us, I want you to remember, just in case you forgot, where we were last week and where Jesus immediately left off. I'm not going to rehearse the whole story of the unjust steward. I'm just going to get to the application that Jesus made in verse 9. Pretty amazing. Jesus told this story about the unjust steward, and he made the application in verse 9, setting before his disciples this amazing reality, which was this. Disciples, I say to you, use unrighteous mammon, i.e., Money, currency within a fallen human system. Use unrighteous mammon to make for yourselves friends, i.e. gospel friends, i.e. money that you bestow to the poor and those in, who are impoverished in turn come to know Christ. Those who you give to through your funding of gospel-centered ministry or through your funding of missionaries and those people come to know Jesus Christ and they become your friends who, as Jesus says, will welcome you into everlasting habitations. So Jesus was applying the parable of the unjust steward to say this, you can use unrighteous mammon, not unrighteously like the steward did when he was just trying to prepare for himself temporal habitations. You can use unrighteous mammon to make gospel friends. You can give to those who are in need. You can give to the cause of the gospel. And these gospel friends will welcome you on that day when you enter into the everlasting habitation that was prepared for you by Christ. That's amazing. That's inspiring. To think that you can't take your money with you when you go. You could try to. You could stack it in a coffin if you want. But it's not going to go where you go. It's going to stay right there while you're going to be somewhere else. It can't go where you go. But the fruit of it can go where you go. It's an amazing reality. Inspiring. And I know many of you, in thinking about the application that Jesus made, said, yeah, that is just a flat-out inspiring reality that broadens the horizons of our imagination gets our wheels turning to think about what God might be doing with the gifts that we offer to people or to causes that are directly connected to the glorification of His name. Pretty amazing. But Jesus' teaching? Far from over. We ended at verse 9 last week. Jesus didn't end at verse 9. He goes on with a series of contrasts in verses 10 through 13 that are intended to instruct His disciples about some realities that are exemplified or forecasted through the way that we handle our earthly finances. We begin with the first of those statements in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, where we read, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So here Jesus is making a statement about what is true and axiomatic. It just is a definitive declaration. If a person is faithful in what is least, he will also be faithful also in much. So the first question you want to ask is, okay, well, what is what is least? And contextually, what is least appears to be unrighteous mammon, i.e. earthly finances, temporal money, that appears to be what is least. And the idea of what Jesus is saying here, if you handle money faithfully according to biblical financial commands and principles, you will also be faithful in the greater stewardships of life. But if you are unjust in the way that you handle money, 
you will be unfaithful in the way you handle the greater stewardships of your life. So let's first ask this then. Or secondly, let's ask this. What does it look like to be faithful in what is least? Again, let's stay contextual. Most immediately, contextually, it looks like using, verse 9, unrighteous mammon to make gospel friends. So for those of you who might not be tracking with that, I'll say it again. That basically means this. When you give to the poor in Jesus' name, Right? You don't do what the rich man does later on in chapter 16, how he steps over Lazarus every day, and he goes to Hades in torment, awaiting judgment, and Lazarus was that one who was redeemed by the grace of God, justified by faith, and he ends up in the presence of Abraham. You don't act like that guy. You use unrighteous mammon not just to pad your own abode like that guy does later in Luke 16. You become the opposite of that, and you give to somebody like Lazarus in Jesus' name. Or you support the ministry of a gospel-centered local church or missionaries who are going into poverty. Papua New Guinea, for example, and you say, I want to use unrighteous mammon to make gospel friends at the ferry terminal in Papua New Guinea, in Tottenville, and beyond. That's the idea of what it looks like contextually to be faithful in what is least. And Jesus said, if you're faithful in what is least, will you also be faithful in what is much? Next question becomes, okay, well, what is much? If handling money is something Jesus identifies as not unimportant, but just what is least compared to that which is more important, that which he describes as much. Well, what is the much? Well, I think the much would be the greater stewardships of our lives. Namely, growing in the grace and godliness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8, verse 37. Maybe it's the different relationships that God's put into our lives. We're told that a noble wife has a worth that far surpasses rubies. Proverbs 31.10 We're told that children are a blessing and inheritance from the Lord. Psalm 127 verse 3 We're told that we are to steward our spiritual gifts as, quote, good stewards of the grace of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. You see a picture of what the much is? A picture of the much is those greater stewardships. Your own call by the grace of God to work out the salvation that has been worked into you by the grace of God. The relationships that you have, whether it's a wife or a husband, children, the local church, the body of Christ, stewarding your gifts. And the amazing thing that Jesus is saying here, if you are faithful in the way that you handle what is least, i.e. money, you'll be faithful in the way you handle those even more blessed responsibilities. But if you're derelict in your finances, in a God-centered way, in some way, some shape, some form, you will be derelict in the stewardship of those greater responsibilities. I want you to see this on the onset. I want you to feel this, because we're going to talk about this a little bit more as we go on. Money may be a little thing, Jesus describes it as that which is least. It may be a little thing, but it shows a lot. It's a little thing that provides with it big revelation. It reveals a lot about a person. If a person is unjust in what is least, they will also be unjust in what is much. Now the word unjust that Jesus uses here is the word adikos. It means unrighteous or wicked. So essentially it means somebody who breaches divine order in either the way that they attain finances or in the way that they steward finances. So in some way, shape, or form, this unjust person is breaching divine order in the way that they attain finances and or in the way they steward finances. Jesus says if you're a person like that, you're not going to be trustworthy in the greater stewardships of life. I'll illustrate this for you. Lauren used to work with somebody who at that respective office would clock in, and before this person clocked in, they would change the clock. So they would clock in, and before they did it, uh, somehow, some way, they knew how to change the clock. I don't know if it was an easy thing or a hard thing. So if they had to show up, I'm just going to create a, you know, an example off the top of my mind. Let's say they had to show up for work 9 o'clock. They came in to work 10 o'clock, but nobody was none the wiser because they would just change the time and make the time 9 o'clock instead of 10 o'clock. 
So they were stealing hours regularly and getting a better paycheck for it. Well, eventually this person was found out, and as you might imagine, the proprietor of the establishment did not appreciate that, and that person was fired from their position. But let me ask you this. If you were going out with your wife on a given night, this is for those of you who have children, you're going out with your wife on a given night, would that be somebody that you would want to babysit your kids? Now, some of you might be like, yeah, I don't care, whatever. But I, I, that wouldn't be me. I would say, no, 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 thank you. I don't want the person who is stealing hours regularly at the job watching my kids. Why? Because if they're unfaithful in what is least, I'm going to put them with the responsibility of watching my children? It's kind of the idea of what Jesus is saying here. It's kind of axiomatic. If you're unfaithful in a little thing, you're going to be unfaithful in a greater thing in some way, some shape, and some form. In her case... In the case of this person, it wasn't that they were, you know, not stewarding their finances to make gospel friends or supporting ministry and missionaries. But I don't believe that they were. I can't say that for sure, but I don't think they were exactly committed to those causes either. But it shows you that being unjust in the way that you handle unrighteous mammon is not only a vertical thing, it could also be a horizontal thing. In the case of the unjust steward, it was both. It was unjust this way, it was unjust that way. Jesus expects for Christians to be both honest and generous. Generosity and honesty are two marks of salvation. They were specifically for Zacchaeus. Right before Jesus made a declaration about Zacchaeus, salvation has come to this house. Right before he did that, Zacchaeus, in Luke chapter 19, verse 8, made this statement. This is, the, by the way, the newly regenerated tax collector who has just come to saving faith in Christ. He says, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Zacchaeus' generosity and honesty were evidences that he had actually been converted. Jesus makes the declaration, salvation has come to this house. In Luke chapter 19, verse 9. So money may be a little thing, but it tells a lot. And this is an important word for Christians. It's very important for Christians to remember that when it comes to how you handle what is least, what is little, it doesn't matter whether you have a lot or a little. It's not a matter of saying, you know what, oh man, if, if, I, if, if, if my annual salary goes up 25000 you watch the way I'm going, to be the, I'm going to be the best giver in the world. How many people have said throughout the course of their life, you know, oh man, if I come into millions, through one means or another, you watch how I would give to the work of God. And the question is, okay, you haven't come into millions, let's not live in the ethereal land of the imagination, let's work with the here and now. Are you faithfully stewarding the little? Because God isn't interested in your hypothetical millions, God is interested in your real ten dollars, or whatever it might be, whatever the stewardship is going to look like for you, and we'll get to specifics of that a little bit later on. So don't be fooled, Christian. Don't be fooled. If you're unfaithful in the little, and I'm going to apply what Jesus is saying even to this. If you're unfaithful in the little that you have, and you're holding out the prospect of future faithfulness based upon, well, if God gives me this, then I'll be faithful with the money He's given me, you're deceiving yourself. Because axiomatically speaking, if you're unfaithful in the little, having more is just going to amplify your unfaithfulness. It's not going to be a good thing. Money really just amplifies the reality that you are currently living in view of. Money will amplify whether or not you are living in view of heaven and in view of gospel grace or whether you are living under earth and humanistic self-indulgence. Money doesn't only amplify, it forecasts. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, Therefore... If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So according to Jesus, I want to emphasize this. What we do week in and week out here is we exposit the text of Scripture. These aren't you know, things I conjured up in my mind. This is Jesus speaking. According to Jesus, earthly stewardship is not only indicative of a present reality, verse 10, but it's also indicative of a future reward or lack thereof. 
It's as though Jesus was saying, if you have consistently squandered away God-given resources for yourself, for your own appetites, for your own pleasures, for your own desires, your own wants, your own needs, do you really think at the end of that you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful steward? Jesus asks, who will commit to your trust the true riches? It's Jesus saying it. If you're not faithful in that little thing in righteous man, who will commit to your trust true riches? Now the last statement is a surprising one. Because we are used to thinking of calling men and women who do not believe the gospel to trust in the sufficient work of Christ on the cross. We're used to calling men and women to trust in God, believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that He paid it all, that He was the sacrificial lamb appointed by God to bear the wrath of all who believe. We're used to calling men and women to that end. We're used to exhorting other believers as they walk through valleys to say, trust God. He's causing all things to work together for good. He's going to bring you through. He hasn't left you. Goodness and mercy are following you, even in the midst of the valley. Goodness and mercy are near you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's right with you. Trust Him. Hold on to Him. Don't look to other sources to get you out of this thing, so to speak. Look to Him. Trust the means He's provided, the means of grace, but look to Him. We're used to calling men and women, even exhorting the body of Christ, to trust in God. But the interesting thing and surprising thing about this verse is that this question is presented. Would God trust you? Now before you start partially paraphrasing in your mind John 2, 24, now Jesus committed himself to no man because he knew what was in the heart of a man. A verse, by the way, which has no bearing on that question that was just begged. See the verse. See what it's asking. Jesus asks in this verse, who will commit to your trust the true riches? I want you to see what he's saying. He uses the adjective pistos here. That's the word that's translated faithful. If you have not been faithful, that word could very readily be translated trustworthy. If you have not been trustworthy, then he uses the verb. He uses an adjective over there for faithful. Then he uses the verb pistio, which means to entrust, when he says who will commit to your trust. So the question that Jesus is asking is essentially this. If you are not trustworthy, with earthly riches, who will entrust to you, i.e. speaking about God, the true riches? It's an interesting turn of thought there to think, well, I'm used to calling people to trust God, but am I trustworthy with that which God has entrusted to me? In the business world, there's been an understandable pushback against the way that success is vilified and money is maligned. So in the business world, Rather than referring to money as its usual term, some people have embraced the identification of certificates of appreciation. So what they do with this term, certificates of appreciation, is they basically say something like this. Okay, rather than going to a store and thinking that the big bad business took your money when they gave you a product, rather think of it this way. You're giving certificates of appreciation to the business who gave you the product. You're in essence saying, thank you. I didn't have access to this product except to coming to your store. So rather than thinking of money as just you know, some bad thing that is taken by the big bad businesses, consider it as a certificate of appreciation by which you show your appreciation to the guy who shows up at your house and fixes your air condition. To when you go to the store and you get coffee or whatever it is. I think there's a lot of merit to that kind of thinking because you're showing that you are appreciative of what somebody is doing. You don't feel like you're getting robbed, so to speak. But more than money could ever be identified as a certificate of appreciation, it really is this. It's a certificate of examination. More so than it's a certificate of appreciation between a customer and a vendor, money is a certificate of examination from God to you and from God to me. It's a means by which He examines us. It's a means by which He tests us. It's a means by which He shows forth what we truly love and what we truly trust in and whom we truly serve. May that change the way you look at the money that enters your possession. It's a certificate of examination. You ever thought of that? You ever thought that when money comes your way, when God has blessed you to receive a paycheck, that it's not just a blessing, but it's also a test? It's a biblical view of what's happening every time you come into finances. Jesus goes on, and he says that if you can't be trustworthy 
uh, with unrighteous man, and who will commit to your trust the true riches? Now we're trying to break this down little by little because I don't want things to escape our minds. We want to ask the question right now, well, what are the true riches, right? What are true riches? I think you could define it in two ways. Fundamentally, true riches are heavenly treasures. You look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 for that. But most particularly, they are, quote, unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. Thus, the truest riches are those which are bound up all in the person and work of Christ. All the treasures of heaven are simply derivatives of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's in Him that all the treasures of God, both for now and eternity, are bound up in. And Jesus is basically saying, this certificate of examination is helping you to forecast your future. If you can't be trusted with this little thing now, do you really think I'm going to commit to your trust the unsearchable riches of my Son? Do you really think you're going to have all the derivatives that come as a result of His person and work? You will have evidenced yourself to be a child of this world, a son of this age who hasn't lived in view of heaven because you've quietly clutched on to your money and you quietly served mammon while you pretended to give lip service to Christ. That's the strong nature of Jesus' words right here in our text. It says you, you will evidence yourself as being disqualified from the true riches. And you don't want to be disqualified from the true riches. Because even fundamentally, these true riches are so much better than temporal riches. For one, true riches are enduring. Temporal riches are fleeting. It's a point that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. One's safe and secure. The other one is fleeting and temporary. That's the difference between true riches and temporal riches. Peter described this treasure like this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, he described it as, quote, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And who is the for you? Verse 5 tells us, those who are kept by the power of God through faith. That's a secure inheritance. It's secure. It's not fading away. It's safe. It's incorruptible, undefiled, and it's reserved not like the riches of this earth. They're not that way. J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary on 1 Peter, uh, tells a story about a man who had a beautiful home in the state of Louisiana willed to him. And on the same night that that person who willed the home died, the house itself was burned down. And the house had no insurance on it. So what is the point of me telling you that story? Get homeowner's insurance if you don't have it. <laughs> if you don't, why don't you? You, you, you do want to have that. But the point of the story is that inheritance was not a secure one. It was a fleeting one. He looked like he had it. It looked like he was going to have it for ages to come, and he didn't. But the inheritance that's in heaven is uncorruptible, undefiled, and reserved. Well, Jesus makes essentially the same point in a different way in verse 12. He said... And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Okay. Let's see the first implication of Jesus' words right here. It's an important reminder. It's an important reminder, and it's found in the first half of the verse. Jesus says, And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, and he's using the parabolic imagery of the story, and he's likening that, carrying that over to this statement, another man's here ultimately refers to God. It could refer to your stewardship of your, if you have some sort of stewardship in which you are entrusted with responsibility from people, but ultimately it's pointing towards God. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, i.e. God's, who will give you what is your own? The important reminder right off the bat is, Everything belongs to God. Our stuff is not really ultimately our stuff. 
Our stuff belongs to God. Here's where I want us to turn to 1 Chronicles 29. And we're going to take a brief journey through this chapter to make a specific point in verse 14. There's a point in verse 14 that I think expounds upon what Jesus is saying here. But I want us to walk through these verses because I think they're edifying and they're instructive. And in a great sense, they're inspiring as you see what it looks like for a godly man and people to be given to the cause of God. We're going to read together from verses 1 through 5, a little bit of context. King David is getting the building supplies together for the temple. Remember, he's not the one who's going to build it. His son Solomon is going to build the temple. David is going to die soon. He's getting the building supplies ready so Solomon can build the temple as God had commanded and ordained. So we're going to read verses 1 through 5 together before we stop. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God I have prepared with all my might gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Orphea, the 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for the things that are of gold, and silver for the things of silver, and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of the craftsmen, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord." Now again, remember, we're walking up to verse 14 to make a specific point that is parallel to Luke 6.12, but along the way, I think there's stuff for us to learn in this passage. The first thing I want you to notice is this. David's proper perspective of what was truly great. Did you see what he said in verse 1? He said, the work is great because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. He had a value system that understood what was truly great. The second thing I want you to see is that he knew that the work, and such great work, demanded great effort. He said, Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might. And the list of valuable materials follows. So he knew what was great. He knew because it was a great work, he was going to do it with all of his might. The third thing I want you to see is he illustrates, this is why we're walking through this, he illustrates the reality of Matthew 6, 21, which says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Did you notice what he said in verse 3? He said, because I have set my affections on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. And fourth, I want you to notice, he even calls the people to participate in such generous giving. He says in verse 5, second half, who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? That's instructive. That's inspiring. May God work that into us to see that which is truly great. To work at that which is truly great with all of our might, not just our leftovers. For us to be given to the work of God and given to generosity because our affections are truly set on things above. And then to exhort others as disciples to say, hey, are you being faithful in that which is least? It goes on though. There's more to be said. We see the reaction of David's charge along with David's reaction to the people's reaction. Verses 6 through 9. Then the leaders of the fathers' houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers of the king's work, offered willingly. They gave for the work of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 darics of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 8,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. Three times 
in those four verses, we're told that the people offered willingly. Second half of verse 6, beginning of verse 9, second half of verse 9. That, as you might have gathered, is the opposite of begrudgingly. They didn't come stamping their feet and rolling their eyes. They came willingly, three times we're told, and they also came joyfully. And think about this, they did this before Paul had written 2 Corinthians 9-7. For Paul had told us God loves a cheerful giver. They didn't even have the luxury of having that swimming in the back of their minds as they were bringing all these offerings to the building of the temple. But they came willingly, rejoiced. David's exhortation did not produce in them a sense of compulsion. David's exhortation was their opportunity. That's the way these kind of truths should be received. They should not produce compulsion. They should be a reminder of opportunity. That brings us to David's prayer. We'll skip down to verse 13 and 14, and I'm going to make the point that we want to make in verse 14. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Watch this language, though. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given to you. It's that last verse, that last verse right there that captures the mindset that produced by the grace of God both faithfulness and generosity in the heart of David. But who am I that we are able to offer so willingly? I think there's at least two possibilities of what he's in awe of right there. I think he's in awe of, one, the ability that he had to give. Like, you've blessed us. We actually have something to give you, God. I'm in awe. Who am I? Who are these people, these Israelites? We don't deserve this. Who are we that we have the ability? But he's not only marveling, I think, at the ability. I think he's marveling at the God-produced generosity that they would be willing to offer it. Who are we that we are able? And who are we that we are willing? We could be clutching onto this. We could see this as our hope. But you've called us to be faithful stewards and we're doing it. Who am I? that you would make me able and that you would make me willing? Who are we that you would make us able and make us willing? Because he knew it all belonged to God. That's the connection between this verse and Luke chapter 6, verse 12. It all belongs to God. He says, all things come from you and of your own we have given to you. <laughs> you give it to us and we're just giving it back to you. All right. Back to Luke. Jesus says, so if we're not faithful in handling another man's goods in the most ultimate sense, that is analogous to us not being faithful with God's entrustment of things to us. Jesus asked, who will give you what is your own? Now that's interesting. Who will give you what is your own? What's to be identified as your own right here? I think, again, contextually, that would be the true riches spoken of in the prior verse. But I think that language, your own, shines another light on a different aspect of the preciousness of the glory of the heavenly treasure that awaits the redeemed. See, everything that you have right now is really not your own, not just because you're a steward, not just because you're accountable, but because your ownership of everything that you have is temporary. There's nothing that you have right now, earthly speaking, that is your own in the most ultimate sense. Everything you have at some point in your life, you will forfeit. Most ultimately, at the point of death, it stops. Everything that you can hold on to, every material thing, stops becoming your own and it goes to another. So there's nothing that you have, there's nothing that I have right now that is, in the most ultimate sense, our own or my own. But these treasures, these heavenly treasures, are, in the most ultimate sense, ours. That's biblical language. Language that Jesus used earlier in Luke. Told the poor, blessed are you, for yours is the kingdom of God. Matthew's Gospel, remember, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Remember the language that Paul used in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 through 23, when he said, all things are yours. 
You know, whether it's Paul or whether it's Apollos or whether it's things to come, all things are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. Every bit of heavenly treasure most ultimately apexed in the person of Christ and the relationship that you will enjoy with God himself for all of eternity is truly your own because you never forfeit it again. You hold on to it. You treasure it for all of eternity. It never leaves your grasp. It is your own. Temporal treasures, not so much. Everything you have, everything I have, is not our own in the ultimate sense. Jesus says, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? And before we move on, I mean, that's amazing, the last statement we just made, but I don't want us to miss the weight of what he's saying. What Jesus is saying there, if you have been enthralled with the riches of this world, and you haven't been faithful in stewarding it the way that the master of the universe has called you to, or if you've been a dishonest steward, I think that's another element that's worth bringing out. If you've been dishonest in the way that you've handled things and you've evidenced yourself not to be faithful, you're unjust in your dealings. You're not only a bad steward vertically, you're a bad steward horizontally. Who will give you these precious treasures that will be your own? That's what he's saying. And then he goes on. He draws it to a last, a last statement before Luke inserts a narrative comment, which we won't touch on this week. Brings us to verse 13. Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now at first glance, we might not get Jesus' point, because we might hear those words and interpret them in light of our 21st century thinking. And we might say, okay, Jesus is saying you can't serve two masters, but you obviously can. I mean, I work during the week at the office, and on the weekends I work nights at the supermarket. So you can have two masters. Like, so I get what he's saying, but he's kind of off a little bit here. No, he's not off at all. He's not saying you cannot have two employers. He's saying you can have two masters. In the ancient Near East context in which Jesus was speaking, slaves, servants, the word servants here could better be understood as slaves. Slaves were owned by a single master. You were owned by that master. You couldn't be fully owned by one master and then fully owned by another master. If you were owned by one master, you were called to be faithful to that master. You were called to do what that master wanted. You were not your own. Your stuff was not your own. That master owned you. You couldn't be owned by two masters. That's what he's saying. Not that no one can have two employers. No servant can have two masters. And the idea was you couldn't be wholeheartedly committed to both. It just didn't work. It doesn't work. And Jesus is likening that to us when it comes to us and riches. Jesus wants us to have a singular focus, a streamlined affection. Because he says right here, you will either love the one and hate the other, or else you're going to be loyal to the one and despise the other. In other words, you cannot be owned by God or wealth. Great moment for a little bit of a question and an application. Think about it. Feel it. Feel the weight of this. Who owns you? Are you more owned by wealth and money? Whether you have a little bit or a lot, I want to keep reminding us about this. It doesn't matter whether you have $1,000 in your bank account, $100 in your bank account, or whether you have $100,000 in your bank account or a million in your bank account. It does not matter. Right? We talked about, in, in earlier in Luke chapter 12, we talked about avoiding being a, a rich fool and a poor fool. Right? The rich fool thinks about all the money that he has and all the money he's accrued. The poor fool keeps thinking about the money that he wants and doesn't have. You don't want to be either one of those people. What consumes your mind more? Does God consume your mind more? Or does money consume your mind more? Feel the weight of this. Feel what Jesus is saying. He's forcing a decision. He's forcing a point of choice right here. You can't serve two masters. One's going to own you. No matter how much you try to talk yourself out of it, it's just not the case. It is true. One is going to have you. Either you're going to see all of you, including your money, as belonging to God, and you're going to want to be a faithful steward and everything that that means with that, or you're not going to want to be that and you're going to find every excuse to avoid it only to find out at the day of judgment it was evidence all the while that you did not belong to Jesus. I don't want any of you to come into that situation. I don't want anybody to stand on that day and all the while of your life on earth you could have been warned, you could have been convicted as it were if you just would have looked at your bank statement. And your bank statement was the evidence that Jesus was not your Lord. 
Mammon's been your God. And the proof is in the pudding. Look, here it is. It's my heart's desire, I know the elders would echo this too, that none of you would quietly serve mammon all the days of your life just to be exposed at the throne of God. No one can serve two masters. Are you a slave to God? Or are you a slave to something else? Most immediately, contextually, are you a slave to mammon, i.e. money, i.e. earthly riches? Over and over again in Scripture, God commands us that He does not want us to be divided in our service to Him. Remember what James said in James chapter 4, verse 4? Friendship with the world is what? Enmity against God. It's not friendship with the world is, you know, well, you, you're walking on thin ice with God. <laughs> All right? Friendship with the world is like, you don't want to do that for too long. No, friendship with the world is enmity against God. You know what Paul said? Remember Galatians chapter 1, verse 10? He said, if I was still a man pleaser, I wouldn't be a servant of God. I couldn't be a servant of Christ if I still was a man pleaser. Well, what do you mean by that, Paul? Well, if I was still just trying to please men, if I wanted men to see how righteous I was, and it was really about being seen by men, and having them think, oh, he's a godly man, he's really righteous. Look at that Pharisee climbing the ranks. He knows his Bible, he can quote it. He's a very godly man. Well, if I was still a man pleaser, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ, is what he was saying. What owns you? Friendship with the world? Performance before men? Covetous, we're told, is as idolatry. See, God doesn't play the middle. He says in the words of Elijah, so to speak, to us by way of application, how long will you halter between two opinions? If Christ is God, serve Him. If Baal is God, serve Baal. You can't play both ends against the middle is what Jesus is essentially saying right here in this text. So again, here comes the forced decision. Will you not, by the grace of God, bow the knee to Baal? Bow the knee to Mammon? I want you to see how crazy this is. You don't want to make the mistake that the Israelites made when they came out of Egypt. Remember what happened just before, the, just before they came out of Egypt? Like right before they came out, God gave them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, so much so that seemingly out of nowhere, all the Egyptians start giving them their gold. They like bless them. They send them on traveling mercies away. And, and they do this, and, and, and all of a sudden, these Israelites have all this, this gold in their possession, and then they go through the Red Sea, and then they come into the wilderness, and they get into the wilderness. Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, and he's not even up there all too long, and all of a sudden, what do the people do? They take the gold that God had granted them, the gift, the blessing that he had given them through the Egyptians, and they take the gold, and they make an idol out of it. They took the blessing of God, which was to be something to say, wow, we don't deserve this. Well, you could have sent us on our way without that and just given us manna from heaven, quail from the water. You could have done anything and provided for us, but you gave us that? How kind are you over and above what we deserve? We don't even deserve that. But instead they took the blessing of God and they made a golden calf. You don't want to do that. You want to escape any proclivity in your fallen flesh to bow the knee to mammon to be more, more consumed with your bank account, to be more consumed with your paycheck, to be more consumed with the money in your wallet and the prospect of the stuff that you could get than consumed with God. You want to use earthly wealth to make gospel friends that will welcome, to, welcome you to where the true riches are. And you want to see wealth, any of it, whether it's a little or a lot, as an opportunity to show the world at least your immediate family especially, and then beyond that, privately, angels, you want to make a declaration that God is greater than gold and that Jesus is more valuable than amassing great amounts of money. I want to close here because I want to give a little bit of counsel today to the person who would say, help me. <laughs> How do I do this? I have the privilege of meeting with people regularly and have the privilege of having conversations like this with people who are growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I want to take this opportunity for is perhaps you're hearing this and you're saying, Amen, I don't want to fall in that category. I do want to be a faithful steward. What does that look like? Help me, teach me. What does it mean? I'm hearing the words of Jesus, but if I'm going to apply that, what does that literally look like practically for me? Well, I want to give you two pieces of information that I think will be helpful for you. Be intentional and be creative. 
But before that, as a little precursor, you may just want to do what I had just made a passing reference to. You may want to take a moment to study your bank statement. Whatever that might look like for some of you. For some, it might literally look like that. Just take a moment and evaluate, okay, what do I currently do with everything that God gives me? This is part of what he's calling me to, be a faithful steward. What am I currently doing? Evaluate it biblically and in a good way, critically. If you are a Christian as somebody who is forgiven by grace, but yet still called to be a good steward, find out what you're spending money on. Are you spending too much money on, I don't know, the list can go on and on. Restaurants, I don't know, movies, food shopping, clothing apparel. The list can go on and on. I can give you a whole list. What are you spending? Think about it. Look at your bank account. Look at your bank statement. But then I want to get you here by way of application. If you're asking, well, what do I do? Give me some advice about what do I do. First thing I said was be intentional. The second thing I'm going to get to is be creative. Being intentional means something like this. Create for yourself some sort of plan. If you're married, I would encourage you, if you haven't done this already, do it with your spouse. Create some sort of plan so that you can figure out where your money is going to go rather than wondering where it went. That's kind of what you want to do. You can use that kind of language to develop a budget. Very popular language to develop a budget. If you don't have that, let me just give you, that's good advice. And then you want to figure out where your money is going based upon biblical financial commands and principles. Watch, it works out beautifully. God has told you, if you're a man who has a family, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. If a man does not provide for his household, he's worse than an unbeliever. So you start figuring out, what do I need to do to set aside money to prepare to take care of my family month in and month out? That's what you do. So you want to do that. You want to save for the future. It's biblical. Proverbs 13, 22 says that a good man lays up an inheritance for his children's children. So that's part of the reason why you want to save, not only for a proverbial rainy day, but because you want to have a plan to meet that Proverbs 13.22 principle. If you have any debt, you want to make it a priority to pay that off. Why? Because the scripture tells us that the borrower is servant to the lender, and Romans 13.8 says very explicitly, owe no man anything. So now all of a sudden you're figuring out how to handle your money based upon the commands of Scripture, not Pastor George's wise counsel or advice. You're just taking Scripture and saying, how do I apply this? You go on from there, and you could say, I want to give to my local church. I'm not saying that because I want anything from you at all. My only desire for you is to be presented before Christ as a faithful steward. And truly, the Bible does say in 1, Thessal in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, that part of what we will be called to give to is to those elders who labor in the word and doctrine. You don't muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. A laborer is worthy of his wages. Those who preach the gospel ought to make their living from the gospel. So when you're working out your plan, that's why giving to a local church, even for those who would be hearing my voice who go to different local churches, it should be your priority to make sure that you are giving where elders are laboring in the word and doctrine and where you are being fed. It's just biblical reality. And you want to make sure you give to the poor. He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. Proverbs 9.17 Peter reminded Paul... Remember the poor. Galatians 2.10 So among everything else that you figure out, my advice to you is to be intentional and put those things, because those are biblical financial commands and principles. If those are not part of your regular intentional giving and at the end of the month you're wondering, what did we do? Ay, 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 we have all this debt because we just kept buying stuff. Maybe there's a problem with buying too much stuff. Oh, I can't believe it. It's the car payment that gets me. That $900 car payment sure is killing me month to month. Well, maybe you're living way above your means trying to have a $900 car payment. I'm trying to aim high because I'm not trying to step on people's shoes intentionally. But I'm just saying, you want to have that kind of steward mentality where you say, it's not my own. And then you want to be creative. This, by the way, this second point is for those of you who say, hey, I'm doing that by the grace of God, and I know by the grace of God, there are those in this room who are doing that. 
And I praise God for the evidence of Holy Spirit produced faithfulness in you. So for those who are doing that, be intentional. I want to then give you some advice to be creative. I don't want you just to be locked into a system that you've created. I want you to be free to move in accordance with the leadership of the Holy Spirit and be ready for every good work that God would have for you. Let me give you a couple of ideas about how to do that. Maybe out of your paycheck each week, you set aside a certain amount of money in an envelope. Keep the money in the house, whatever that is. If you're married, decide with your wife. If you're not married, figure it out on your own. Pray, have the Lord kind of guide you into what that figure is. And have an envelope in your house with a certain amount of cash on hand. And that is your own personal giving fund. And you're looking for opportunities. Now you have a giving fund. And if a month goes by and you haven't given to anybody, you're thinking, okay, wow, that's actually accruing. So besides just taking out of your own money, which you could do, of course, take out of your checking account, maybe you say, I got this envelope here and I know there's a need and I'm ready, willing, and able to meet that need. That's one thing you could do. If you travel to a place, please hear this. If you travel to work and you walk by homeless people and you walk by people that are in need, I want to give you an idea. Maybe you get another idea from this idea. Maybe you go to the store and maybe you get a greeting card. One of those little greeting cards in the store. Maybe it's 99 cents. And you go home, you sit down with about 10 of them. You pray and you write a gospel message in there. Maybe with some other verses of exhortation or encouragement. And you write a message right in there. You put in there maybe a gift card to a food establishment that you know is going to be found in the different places where you travel to and from work. And in your little pack that you have, if you happen to have one, you could put it in the pocket of your coat or wherever, you have these envelopes ready. And all of a sudden there's a homeless man who's sitting by the side of the road, somebody who asks you for some spare change, and you say, as a matter of fact, I've been praying for an opportunity like this. I have a card for you. I want you to take it. And all of a sudden now, you're prepared for it. You're not like, oh, oh i got to go. Here's a... Uh. <laughs> You're prepared, you're ready to give because you've been traveling back and forth and you've been, or you're intentional, but you're also creative. Maybe you sponsor an intern for a local church or a parachurch ministry. I speak as one who was called into ministry via a man sponsoring me for a one-year internship. A man who, as you know, many of you know, was very successful uh, in his field, in his business sponsored me at the church that I was first on staff at, first there as an intern. He sponsored me. I was only supposed to be there for the summer. Then I was supposed to work at Two World Financial. This man gave $120,000 to that church, $100,000 to refurbish the downstairs where a lot of our meetings would happen, and also $20,000 to bring me on staff for a year. $20,000. That was going to be my annual sal salary. Fork in the road. What do you do? Do you work at Two World Financial? Or now do you go and you take the $20,000 a year salary? Well, I'm emphasizing right now that that man was generous enough to give that. And you don't have to give $20,000 to sponsor an internship. There's a lot of people, even among us, who don't live on that much. And there's a lot of people that you can give great opportunities with a little. Cause just because you thought to be intentional and creative. So what is the hope of this? I think, I think everybody, I'm pretty confident of this. That everybody in this room, the cachet of credibility by God's grace in the weeks past, you know that this isn't some sort of some part of some sort of giving plan for our church. I want to let you know by the grace of God, uh, many of you, I don't know who gives what, but I do see the numbers at the quarterly meetings, and I'm thankful for the way that people are being led by the Holy Spirit to honor the Lord in that way. So this is not in reaction to anything. We're actually, by the grace of God, showing evidence that people are doing that. This is just us walking through the scriptures. And Jesus had a lot to say about making sure we're guarded from worshiping our money quietly. Not only publicly and overtly. And such is our desire for you. You can get excited. Last week was inspirational. Start imagining people from Papua New Guinea and Portugal showing up at your eternal doorstep. It's pretty inspiring to think of that happening. This week was instructional, and both are necessary. So I encourage you, maybe in the weeks ahead, you listen to last week, you get some inspiration, listen to the end of this message, get some inspiration, and then get, make sure you get a lot of instruction, because it's important.